In 1945, 10 million American soldiers returned home. After a long and brutal war, men and women were eager to embrace a new kind of life. Do you swear to love me forever and ever? I do, I do. Suddenly, for the famous and not so famous, marriage became a kind of national obsession. In the first year of peace, 2.2 million couples married. Soon after, the average marriage age dropped to 18. Between the war's end and 1950, 32 million babies were born. This marriage and baby boom was to solve the dislocations of the war. American men and women would live happily ever after. Or would they? Come on, baby, let the good time roll. Come on, baby, let me thrill your soul. Come on, baby, let the good time roll. Roll all night long. Come on, baby, yes, this is me. This is something I just can't miss. Come on, baby, let the good time roll. Miss America time. The shapeliest beauties in all America, 51 of them parade at Atlantic City for the title. Overpowering all opposition is strapping 5 foot 10, 143 pound Miss Utah. Nearby Asbury Park holds a quest for Mrs. America. She's got to cook as well as look. 32 married lovelies show they know potatoes have to be peeled. Bed making comes next. Into the beds go the testers, the best beds by Mrs. New York City. Hmm, feels comfortable. But it's the body beautiful that's the criterion for the well-rounded Mrs. America. And finally, the winner. Watch out, Mrs. America. Mrs. America was more than a contest. It was a new way of life. Women found themselves on a peculiar pedestal, honored as sexy, fertile homemakers. Yes, wife can be beautiful. Mrs. America set impossibly high standards. A loving mother, she had a figure like an hourglass and was as efficient as a sewing machine. She wore high heels when she scrubbed the floors and was as clean and pure as laundry detergent. She was to be the ultimate symbol of the new affluence. By the mid-50s, half the families in America had entered the middle class. At last, my love has come along. Women turned to magazines to learn how to adapt to their new roles in the land of plenty. I think the mass magazines was in their interest to create this ideal uh, American family because their interest was to sell consumer goods. The advertising is almost all directed at women. There's always a woman standing in front of a new refrigerator, a woman standing in front of a car. It was extremely powerful. My heart was wrapped up in clover the night I One woman who eagerly bought the message sold by the mass magazines was a young writer from New York, Betty Friedan. In 1952, like so many other Americans, she and her husband Carl moved to the suburbs. We bought a house in Rockland County and I did all the things that women as supposed to do with those and, and enjoy them, you know. Uh, chauffeuring the kids and the school board battles and and uh, tuna fish casseroles and, 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 and liked it. It was enjoyable. I had three kids and I, 
I loved my kids as far as that was concerned and liked having kids. But uh, it was like an itch I couldn't quite suppress that I, that despite the fact that I now wrote Housewife on the census plan, I wrote for freelance for women's magazines, sort of like secret drinking in the morning. Friedan was popular with her editors until she began to write pieces about women who tried to balance a career with motherhood. Uh, I wanted to write once an article about a woman who was a sculptor. I could write about her painting her child's crib, but I couldn't write about her serious work. It'll be nice to be just a housewife where there'll be no great demand for either talent or brains. Why, Ellen Douglas, that's the silliest thing I've ever heard you say. Of course, you don't mean it. Certainly, I mean it. All you have to know is what switch to turn, what buttons to push, and what cans to buy. Does Bill know he's marrying a can opener instead of a wife, too? He's in love with me. cum laude graduate, Betty Friedan, returned 15 years later for a class reunion. She was working on an assignment to find out if the ambitions of her classmates had been fulfilled. She asked them a series of questions. What difficulties have you found in working out your role as a woman? What are the satisfactions and frustrations of your life today? What do you wish you had done differently? In response, her classmates, most of them housewives, were deeply dissatisfied. There was a whole lot of women, evidently, each one thinking she was alone, who uh, didn't somehow experience an orgasm throwing the powder into the dishwashing machine. During the reunion, Betty Friedan was also struck by the attitudes of the Smith undergraduates. According to one survey, half of all America's co-eds had dropped out of college either to marry or to avoid acquiring knowledge that might frighten men. I remember at the reunion, I was talking to some of the seniors that were then graduating, and I said, which courses do you get all excited about? And these young girls would say to me, oh, we don't get excited about things like that. I spend every weekend with Jack and Gage, too, and want to go have three kids or four kids. And when I heard this, and I thought, hey, what's happened? Oh. In the 50s, even teen magazines pushed the idea of wedded bliss. By the end of the decade, over 14 million girls were engaged by the age of 17. We want to get married, but we are so young. Dating patterns also began to imitate marriage. Before the war, uh, there was a couplet, going steady with one date is OK if that's all you rate, if that's all you can get. Whereas after World War II, the rise of going steady was really linked with the rise of young marriage. Going steady was the mark of success, and that was a shocking development to a lot of their parents. The first reason, the most obvious reason, was sex. Hello, Frank. Listen, the family says no, but I'll sneak out tomorrow night and meet you anyway. Okay? Swell. A lot of the people who got married when they were 18 didn't see it as closing down their options, but as escaping into an exciting life where they don't have to live with their parents anymore, but can live with their husband or wife and have sex whenever they want to. And, you know, it, it was a great life as they saw it. Mr. Sandman, bring me a dream. Make him the cutest that I've ever seen. 
For these increasingly young wives, life was good, as the nation was in the midst of an economic boom. But in the women's magazines meant to guide young marrieds, life was almost too good. They set an impossibly high standard for family life, even as they suggested that homemaking should fulfill all of a woman's hopes and dreams. This small, narrow domestic world, which which does carry a, a, a strong em a, a emotional freight, was made to carry more than it should have. When families did have problems, as they all inevitably did, they felt guilty. Betty Friedan found that many women liked their roles as mothers and wives, but resented the idea promoted by the women's magazines that no other role was possible. Can't you be just a college professor's wife? Isn't that enough? And play goes to your hamlet. Oh, no, I'm not going to sit at home with the four walls and count pennies or alter myself to suit your friend's taste. My work isn't important enough. I'm only a woman. He'd like me to be a slave to the house while some cutie on the paper whispers into his ear what a great big reporter he is. As the decade progressed, women started going back to work. Though largely confined to dead-end jobs, nearly 70% of all middle-class wives worked outside the household to earn extra money for the family. Families wanted all the goods that the abundant post-war America promised, and so women often would contribute to the household income. Um, but what you see throughout the 1950s is a real praise of women in the home that keeps pushing the happiness that should come to women from being homemakers and mothers. To describe these contradictory pressures on women, psychiatrists identified a new disorder, the housewife's blight. To cope with the problem, doctors began to prescribe antidepressants in record numbers. The drug of choice was Milltown. So By 1957, three years after the drug's release, Americans had consumed 1.2 million pounds of Milltown. Becoming more and more aware of a growing discontent, Betty Friedan tried to interest some of the women's magazines in an article on the issue, but none of her regular outlets would publish her findings. The only thing I saw was an outline that said women have been brainwashed into being housewives, and it seemed to me pretty extreme. And so I said to her agent, I don't know what's happened to Betty, uh, but I really am not interested in this. And Red Book said, well, she's always written good stuff for us before, but she's gone off her rocker. Only the most neurotic women will identify with this. To Friedan, part of the problem was that almost all of the women's magazines were run by men who were practicing a kind of unconscious censorship. What I realized is that, that somehow that what I had written threatened the basic foundation or the based boundaries of women's world as, as seen and perpetuated by the women's magazines, uh, which uh, I call then the feminine mystique. She set out to write a book with the same title. When it was finally published in 1963, it became the handbook of a new feminist movement. What I underestimated was how that book as a scream of pain would resonate with so many women for so many years and lead them to rethink their lives. What do you mean, what's happened to me? I don't know. Except that you've lost your guts and all of a sudden I'm ashamed of you. Tom and Betsy Rath should have been happy. They had managed to buy a new house. They had healthy children and a rising income. But for reasons they couldn't understand, they were deeply dissatisfied with their lives. School. Without talking about it much, Tom and Betsy Rath began to think of their house as a trap. And they no more enjoyed refurbishing it than a prisoner would delight in shining up the bars of his cell. The mystery of a growing dissatisfaction was at the heart of the most famous 50s novel, 
The Man in the Gray Flannel Suit. It became a bestseller and a popular movie because it captured in very human terms a certain desperation that lingered behind the new affluence. The more money Americans made, the more they seemed to spend. No paycheck and no house ever seemed to be big enough. The book was written as a protest against the conformity in which I felt I was being shoved. And I didn't reason that all out at the time. I thought it was just autobiographical, especially the first part of it. When Sloan Wilson returned from the war, he and his wife, like Tom and Betsy Rath in the novel, were deeply insecure about what they had. Working at a steady but dull job, Sloan Wilson felt a terrible social pressure to do whatever it took to earn more money, buy a bigger house, and drink a better brand of gin. I had friends who got involved with uh, large boats, yacht clubs, country clubs, mansions, all this, this stuff, and went broke on 200000 a year, and then found themselves owing back tax money. So this was really quite a common disaster. During the 50s, a new consumer's aid was invented, the credit card. For the first time in history, average Americans could buy now and pay later. By the end of the decade, Sears had issued credit accounts to one out of every five American families. A nation of savers had become a nation of debtors, hustling to meet their monthly payments. Well, I hear there's a spot opening up in public relations where I work in United Broadcasting. What would it pay? Oh. I don't know, eight, ten thousand, I guess, something like that. Well, I could certainly do with eight or ten thousand. But I don't know anything about public relations. Who does? You got a clean shirt, you bathe every day, and that's all there's to it. The higher a man gets in business, the harder the moves get. Climbing the ladder to success was a grim business. In the 50s, it was called the rat race, a competition to see who could be the best company man. The man in the great flannel suit touched a nerve. It's a great title. Am I a colorless man? Am I a functionary at a high level? Have I lost control of my life? Do I belong to the corporation I work for rather than to myself? Have I made the right choice or have I settled for something? I mean, most of us worked for big corporations in those days. And uh, the big corporation was in some ways more authoritative than the armed services were. Glad to have you aboard, Tom. Thank you, Gordon. I was working for Time and Life uh, shortly after I got out of the service, and a uh, young man from the personnel department was dispatched to tell me that I was not dressed properly. He we said, uh, you really ought to go to Brooks Brothers and, no, and get a gray flannel suit. We'd like to see something else, perhaps a uh, dark gray. But I, I suddenly realized it was a uniform of the day, that I was back in the service, that I had to dress like this. And I began very much to resent it. I've always, I suppose, like many writers, wonder, wondering, you know, what kind of man am I? Who am I? And I looked in the mirror one day, and I said, I know what I am. I'm just a man in a gray flannel suit. One more. In the novel, Tom Rath could never escape the memories of war. Come on, Tom, we gotta get out of here. All right, get out of the way. It's strange. I was only in the service four years, and I'm 75 years old. It's a tiny part of my life, but maybe half of everything I've written is about the war. The feeling that you were a white knight it was a wonderful feeling that we are fighting the, the forces of evil uh, and winning. And to uh, get yourself together and uh, run a good part, your own tiny part of the whole military machine, but to run it right, in my case, a small ship. We were jumped by a Japanese plane and we shot it down. It does confer a certain dignity upon a young man. with all these powerful, churning emotions. And somehow, 
the whole scene has gone. You know, it's like somebody put off the movie projector. Suddenly, Wilson, the war hero, like so many others, had become just another man on a train. Every day, suburban office workers streamed into the city. Every night, they staggered home, relieving the relentless pressure in the bars. I drank a lot in those days, and uh, almost everybody I knew did. You had to wait in Grand Central to get a train. Well, you waited at a bar and had a drink. Then you get on the train, that's boring, so you go in the bar car and have a drink. Then you get home, and there's a certain tension in getting home and seeing what's happening there, so you have a martini there. So you've had a lot of drinks before you even start drinking. Good evening, children. Tom Rath and Sloan Wilson were haunted by the emptiness of their lives. They were living a lie, because they could not reveal to their wives the passion and the romance of their wartime memories. You remember the terrible hunger, not just for sex, but for love, or for something good in your life. I think everybody feels that he or she has some shadow over them, you know, that we can't quite get rid of. And I think what the resonance of this book is something that's applicable to a lot of his fellow Americans at that time. Something did happen to me in the war, something I've never told you about. I have another child, Betsy, a son in Rome. I've never heard from his mother since we left there. But now she's written to it. I don't know how to make you realize the way things were then. Nobody knows who wasn't in the war. I killed 17 men I was actually looking at, looking right straight at them. Not enemies at a distance that I couldn't see, but persons. Persons like you see in the train, in the elevator. Was having a child worse than things like that? I don't know. Only the child has happened to me. In the novel, Tom and Betsy Rath solved their problems by confronting them honestly. Sloan Wilson faced the truth of how trivial his life had become when a rival junior executive beat him to the job of holding the hat of Wilson's boss. I realized I'd been one up and that he had seen that the hat's what should be taken. And I said to him meekly, can I hold my man's hat? And then I started to laugh and nobody had any idea why I was laughing. He didn't think it was funny. He said, yes, you may hold your man's hat. And I thought, I gotta get out of here. You know, this is, this is not, uh, this is not a life for me. And the next day I did quit. Sloan Wilson decided to become a full-time writer. When his first marriage ended in divorce, he sold his house and bought a sailboat where he now lives. Now remarried, he has produced a number of well-regarded novels, but none as successful as The Man in the Gray Flannel Suit. I would think that if you asked Sloan Wilson, he would tell you that for the rest of his life, people came up and told him, your book spoke to me. You are the one that defined our generation. By 1956, one year after the release of Gray Flannel Suit, there was a sense that the country was opening up. Interstate highways fanned out across the country. The U.S. Army replaced its mule unit and messenger pigeons with helicopters. New franchises opened up. Burger King, Midas Muffler, Kentucky Fried Chicken, along with the first indoor shopping mall. Remote control banking and TV soap operas began. The first Godzilla movie arrived from Japan as Ampex sold its first videotape recorder. There were new words, brainstorming, head shrinker, industrial park, tranquilizer. Dear Abby began dispensing advice. Amidst all this, America's traditional values were about to be shattered by a housewife from New York. We will worship God by singing hymn number 219. 
base of our planet. In the mid-1950s, the image of small-town America as a pure, incorruptible place was almost sacred. Then, in 1956, in one small town in New England, a writer known as Pandora in blue jeans set free the roiling passions that lurked below the surface of America's heartland. Indian summer is like a woman, ripe, hotly passionate, but fickle. She comes and goes as she pleases so that one is never sure whether she will come at all, nor for how long she will stay. Do you make love to me? Oh, yes, yes, of course. One year early in October, Indian summer came to a town called Peyton Place. People were ashamed to be seen reading it. Everybody was talking about it. It was sort of an atomic pile, and you dared not go anywhere near it. I remember the diamond hard nipples in the famous beach scene. Whose nipples were they? I can't remember what her name was. Selena, I don't, I don't, names were unimportant. Okay. Body parts are what counted. Everybody was furious. And my editor up at the Citizen, he called me in and he said, you've written so many articles about this book coming out. He said, I don't see how you could do that. That's a dirty book. I don't see how any woman could write a book like that. The unlikely author of Peyton Place was a New Hampshire housewife with three children named Grace Metallius. In a way that was unusual for the time, Grace had written portraits of independent, passionate women and revealed shocking details about small town life. To a tourist, these towns look as peaceful as a postcard picture. But if you go beneath that picture, it's like turning over a rock with your foot. Everybody who lives in town knows what's going on. There are no secrets, but they don't want outsiders to know. If I didn't care more than words can say. Grace was born in 1924 in the French-Canadian ghetto of Manchester, New Hampshire. The famous Amiskeag textile mills had drawn so many workers from Quebec that the west side of town was known as Little Canada. To escape from the grim life of the mills and to shield herself from the tantrums of her alcoholic mother, Grace retreated into the world of books and dreamed of becoming a writer. In high school, Grace met George Metallius. He was poor and he was of Greek descent, something which horrified Grace's mother. But he was handsome and he had a car. Grace's dreams of romance withered in marriage. In the small town of Gilmanton, New Hampshire, George's annual salary as a high school principal, only $3,000. I'm trapped, trapped in a cage of poverty and mediocrity. If I don't get out, I'll die. Grace found her escape in her writing. A mother of three, she had little interest in keeping up with the appearances suggested for a woman in the 1950s. She wore a man's checked shirt, red and black, a pair of jeans and uh, shoes of some sort, and that's how she dressed all the time. Grace had started her novel before she moved to Gilmanton, but she began to draw more heavily on local stories. There was a lot of sex where you go with somebody's husband and uh, maybe produce a child of his. It was done a great deal in town here. Don't you say things about my father. He was a wonderful man. Wonderful and fine and good. That's what I told you. Well, I lied. I lied about him because I was ashamed of him and of myself. Well, then why did you marry him? I didn't. And he didn't marry me because he already had a wife. You had all these people that were supposed to act perfect in front of other people. And then behind closed doors, you had wife beating, you had alcoholism, you had child abuse, you had all kinds of really nasty stuff going down. She was writing about battered women before we even had the term battered women, writing about domestic violence before we had them. She was writing about the feminine mystique, and we didn't have that term. Uh, she was writing about things that we had no names for. One of the most sensational local stories concerned a young girl who had murdered her father. Grace wrote it as I told it to her, and it concerned 
a farm family here. What had happened was that the father molested his daughter for years. By the time I started teaching you something. Lucas! Lucas, let me go! Lucas! Never had nothing I ever wanted. She killed him with the fire irons, and she and her little brother dragged him out to the sheep pen because in the winter you can't bury anybody here. The ground is hard. But the sheep lie on the ground in their pen and they keep the ground soft. When she finished the book, Grace's husband pushed her to send it off to publishers. But no one seemed to know how to take it. It contained graphic scenes of sex and violence. The main character was a smart, independent woman who seemed to enjoy sex and who wanted to work more than she wanted to marry. It was rejected by every publisher who saw it. Then one day in New York City, the manuscript found its way to Julian Messner and Company, the only New York publishing house run by a woman. She saw the value in the book and had the power to get it published. Her name was Kitty Messner. Kitty was halfway through it. She, she stayed up a good deal of the night. She was caught up by it, absolutely electrified by it. And she came in the next day, if I remember correctly, and said, here, read this. I was the editor of adult books for the company. And uh, she said, I love it. And she continued reading it while I went through the first part, and I agreed with her that this had a lot of potential. I'm not saying that we, we thought we had Peyton Place here. Kitty Messner was an extraordinary person, uh, far ahead of her time. Kitty was tall, willowy, not beautiful, but stunning. She wore a beautifully tailored brown jacket and marvelous slacks when no one wore slacks. This is 1955, remember. She loved gambling. She was very liberal politically. She had a mouth like a longshoreman, but very charming. She was a, a woman doing unconventional things in a man's world. Here was a book that said a woman could do unconventional things in a man's world. Kitty Messner called up Grace Metallius in New Hampshire and said, sweetie, I love your book. Hey there, you with the stars in your eyes. Kitty Messner sent for Grace. For the first time in her life, Grace traveled to New York City. The novel she had written between dishes in New Hampshire was going to be published. So when she arrived in our office for the first time, dressed in a uh, sort of flannel plaid shirt and blue jeans, it was quite remarkable. And she calculated that, I think. She knew that when you come to New York to meet your book publisher, you probably ought to wear a dress. But she very carefully came down and gave us all the finger. Both Kitty and Grace were rebels without cause. They clicked immediately. They just were crazy about one another. And I think probably the fact that the women were sort of running the show in the book did appeal to both of them. When Kitty Messner edited the book, she only asked for two substantial changes. She insisted that Grace tone down the incest and pushed her into adding another love scene. So she got very annoyed and she went over and sat down at the typewriter and bang, bang, bang. She typed it out. Your legs are absolutely wanton. Please, she said. Please. And then, yes. Yes, yes, yes. And she pulled it out of the typewriter and said, here's your sex. And it was a very nice uh, bit of sex between the principal and the girl that ran the dress shop, Connie. Howard Goodkind thought there might be a publicity angle in the Grace Metallia story. And I said, it occurred to me that there are all over the United States thousands and thousands of women saying, if only I didn't have these kids, I could do something with my life. And here's a woman with three children living in what amounted to a tar paper shack up there with a husband making, what, two, three thousand dollars a year, a principal in a small school. And she had a book published. And I thought that's pretty exciting. With $5,000, he hired a New Yorkist and set off to Gilmanton to find a way to sell the novel by pushing Grace's story. When we knocked on her door, 
We had to step over a pile of garbage to get in. I mean, literally. There were flies everywhere. And off in a corner was her typewriter and her little table and her chair. And that's where she wrote this book. I, I must say, my first reaction getting over the, the first few minutes was to be even more impressed than I'd been before that she'd been able to accomplish this. As New Yorkers like Goodkind began showing up in Gilmanton, townsfolk grew anxious about rumors that the book would expose local scandals. When locals pressured Grace to move and her husband was fired from his job, Grace told a reporter it was all on account of Peyton Place. Now that, that takes a certain canniness, which is unusual for somebody living in Gilmanton, New Hampshire. And within a matter of a day or two, the headlines started to appear about censorship in New England. There was a Boston newspaper that had huge headlines, Teacher Fired for Wife's Book. And I've compared those headlines with the headlines I had for World War II, and they were about the same size. The Messner Company took out a full-page ad in the New York Times capitalizing on the controversy. It stirred up so much interest that advance orders pushed the book onto the bestseller list even before it hit the bookstores. All of her publicity pictures at the time showed her in like lumberjack shirts and jeans or something. And I mean, it was a scandal. Her appearance was as much of a scandal as the book was. Howard Goodkind promoted Grace as a mythic figure reborn in small town America. He dubbed her Pandora in blue jeans. The legend is that Pandora was the goddess that opened the box that she was not supposed to open. And it was just as much as it to say that her book let all the troubles that were bothering people out. We didn't have any idea at all what was going to happen. I thought we might end up making $1,500 and sold maybe 2,000 copies, 3,000 copies. That would have been good. In the first month, Peyton Place sold 100,000 copies. Within two years, sales surpassed Gone with the Wind. Eventually, the paperback would sell over 8 million copies. Everything simply exploded. Everybody wanted to meet this Grace Metallius. People are surprised, Grace, that a book so full of sex and violence could have been written by you, a housewife and mother of three children. Well, for heaven's sake, sex and violence is around all the time. Isn't it? Should be in surprise to anyone. I knew a guy who had a special pocket sewn into his black jacket so that he could put Peyton Place in there and pull it out. And of course, it opened to the good parts. I used to sneak my copy to school and we'd take it into the washroom and read it to each other. I mean, it was very scandalous. Peyton Place was banned in Rhode Island and Fort Wayne, Indiana. Under tariff provision 1201, Canada refused to allow the book to be imported. Undaunted Canadians smuggled copies in and read them in brown paper wrappers. What do you think of the banning of literary works in general? I think it's a rotten idea from the word go. I detest the idea behind it. I, I hate the feeling that anyone else in the world is going to tell me what I will be allowed to read, what I will be allowed to see. Because this is, to me, is the same as someone telling me what I'm going to be allowed to think. The defenders of Peyton Place defended it on its social merits, that this tells what really takes place in, a, in small town New England. I mean, it wasn't defended because it was fun to read the sex scenes. It was defended because it was honest and true. 20th Century Fox bought the rights to the book and produced a sanitized but star-studded movie version. When she received her rights fee of $125,000, Grace took the check down to the Gilmanton General Store and presented it as payment for a quart of milk. Is it about the people of Gilmanton? It certainly is not. It was three quarters written before I ever moved to Gilmanton. Where, where on earth, then, did they get the idea that it was about them? Well, I think you can get very Freudian about that if you want to and start talking about guilt complexes and all that sort of thing. 
With me, I always simplified it and called it, if the shoe fits, put it on. And apparently, this is what the people of Gilmanton did. As a public figure, Grace was suddenly open to criticism from people in the town who thought their secrets were being exposed and critics at large who attacked her because, as a woman, she wasn't supposed to write like a man. She told me, she said, people are going to hate me. And that's when she started to drink. I remember one morning at 9 o'clock, she arrived here with a six-pack of beer, and I had never seen this in her before. It was something within Grace that made it impossible for her to take advantage of that success and get some pleasure out of it. I, I think she searched everywhere for, I mean, it's a little corny, but for some kind of internal happiness, which she never seemed to be able to find. The times I knew her, she seemed excited about her success, but never really happy about it. I, I remember her being in tears a lot, right from the beginning. Later on, alcohol and tears. Grace wrote a sequel to Peyton Place and two other novels. But high living, an unscrupulous agent, and a continuing battle with alcohol reduced Grace to poverty once more. In a last desperate attempt to generate some cash, she opened the Peyton Place Motel. It went out of business after two months. On February 25th, 1964, Grace Metallius died of liver disease. People would call on the phone and they'd say, you know, don't bury Grace in Gilmanton, you know, get out of town, and we don't want her body here. Things like that. It was, I mean, she was dead. Who was she going to hurt? You know? Blue Standing alone Without a dream in my heart Without a love of my own While a TV series based on Peyton Place continued to make money for 20th Century Fox, Grace had sold all her rights. What was left of her estate was sold to pay for back taxes. In a final fire sale, a man named Joseph Stanton bought Metallius's precious typewriter for $75. Do you think that Peyton Place will be remembered? I doubt it very much. You don't, think, much. You don't think that 25 years from now, the name oh, Peyton Place will no. mean anything? No, no. Thank you, Grace. Grace Metallius. Well, thank you for having me. In the end, the town that Grace had exposed to the world reclaimed her. Her resting place remains a kind of marker of her struggle to speak honestly about men and women and the pent-up passion, anger, and conflict that lurked below the surface in the 1950s. The 50s was sort of a waiting period. You had the feeling that the pressure was building up, something was going to explode. And I think that in a funny way, uh, Grace may have touched some of that. I've met many people since then who, who said about their own town, wherever it was, Mississippi, Texas, Oregon, my town was a Peyton place. I'd like to know whose town was not a Peyton place.